I spent 17 years of my life as a drug user in one form or the other. That ended in June 2011. Six years of that was IV heroin use towards the end. And as you've heard, I was also a former prosecutor. So those life experiences lifted me up on this perch where I can look at our quote unquote war on drugs because I've lived on both sides. And tonight what I want to do is take you up there with me so that you can see what we've built has been built on racism, prohibition, and criminalizing a mental health disorder. In order to best do that, the best analogy I could think of is to build a house. And now this is a house every single one of us live in. I don't care who we are, especially right now with, with what's going on with substance use, especially opioids, we have all been impacted in one way or the other. Most of us probably know somebody who's lost somebody or who has died. So in order to build this house so we can see this and see the dynamic and see the destruction it causes, um, first what we have to do is we have to pick land. And this happened a very long time ago. We picked our land back in the 1840s. And we picked our land based on racist attacks towards the Chinese. Came over in this country as indentured servants to build our railroads. And they brought their culture with them. And part of that culture was opium dens. So we did, have, we did have opium dens in this country for quite a while. And among those other three themes we discussed, there's one other theme that overrides everything, and that is our need to protect white women from minorities. Because we started this attack on the Chinese because we feared that they were turning white women into sex slaves. So we started shutting down opium dens. And then something else happened at this time in the 1880s. It was our first inclination, our first evidence that just say no policies do not work long before Nancy Reagan. It was called the temperance movement in this country, a movement of no drugs, a Puritan movement. It was at this time that they demonized substance use, referred to it as a moral deficiency. Well, when they did this, just like in the 80s, what we saw in the 1880s was our biggest rise of opium imports into this country, a rise in opium use, and a rise in morphine use directly related to our efforts to a just say no policy. So that's our land. And then it's time to lay the cement. And how we lay the cement is part of the reason why this house is stuck and we cannot move it. Because we laid the cement with the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1915. That act put a mental health disorder, drug use, firmly into the criminal justice system. It's part of the reason why we cannot get it out. We hear all these buzzwords on the news. We can't arrest our way out of the problem, help, not handcuffs. They sound great, but they will not work because of that cement. Then it's time to build a frame. And the frame of this house was our treatment and how treatment was set in this country a very, very long time ago. It was set in 1919 by a Supreme Court case called Webb versus United States. See, Webb was a pharmacist, and he was treated a morphine user with morphine, something we know today works. We know it as titration, we know it as moderation, we know it as medication-assisted treatment. However, the Supreme Court of the United States came down and said, no, that's a felony. You are not allowed to treat a drug user with the same drug they're using or anything else besides abstinence. So we pigeonholed our treatment at the time to this model that today we know does not work. And at the same time as Webb versus United States, it was the birth of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, the predecessor of the Oxford Group. Doctors were formulating their opinions on how to treat substance use and alcohol use. Anything but abstinence at the time was deemed a felony. So there should be no question in our minds as to why that modality took such a firm hold when we know today it doesn't work. The best way to compare it is to talk about other health conditions. If I go to my doctor and he says, Chad, I've got some very bad news for you. You've got diabetes and very high cholesterol. I've got even worse news for you. That cholesterol is going to kill you very soon. However, I refuse to treat it unless you get that, that diabetes under control. Furthermore, if you don't stop the activities that are making your diabetes worse, I'm going to throw you in jail where well, you will get no help whatsoever for either condition. I think everybody in this audience probably will lose it a little bit if a doctor talked to them like that. But that is systematically how we treat drug users in this country. We refuse to treat their HIV, hepatitis C, co-occurring disorders, trauma, grief, a whole plethora of issues until they arrest their drug use. 
when a lot of the times those things we're refusing to treat are what are driving the drug use. So we can see this land, this cement, this frame is inherently flawed. Then we had to give somebody keys to this house in order to take care of it. The first person we gave keys to was a guy named Harry Aslinger. He was the uh, director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which would later become the DEA. Henry, Harry was one of those prolific racists of our time. All of our marijuana prohibition is directly responsible to him, and his attacks on marijuana were based on attacks on minorities. Um, I apologize for some of the words I used. They're his, not mine. But Harry made statements that reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. Smoking marijuana makes white women seek relations with minorities. This is the basis of why marijuana is illegal and why we have many of our drug policies that emerge through this country. Now, some of us can think to ourselves, all right, 1930s, Jim Crow is alive and well. I can kind of not agree, but maybe understand that mentality a little bit. 2013, Governor Lepage, former governor of Maine, makes a statement that these guys named D-Money, Shifty, Smoothie, they come from New York, they come from Connecticut, they come here to sell their heroin. Half the time, they impregnate a young white girl along the way. Then we have another problem to deal with. 2013, nothing has changed since we picked that land and started attacking Chinese people because we were trying to protect white women from them. This is the house we live in. Then it was time. Then Harry also did a few other things. A um, little history lesson. Harry, Harry uh, chased down uh, Billie Holiday to her deathbed because she sang a song called Strange Fruit, a song that was about lynching black men. That was one of the things that launched our war on drugs. And at the same time, that Harry was sending an agent to track down Billie Holiday and infiltrate her inner circle to arrest her for using drugs. He told his agents to leave Judy Garland alone, who now we know in history, Judy Garland was a heroin user. White girl, black woman, singing anti-lynching songs. This is the house we live in. Then the keys were passed down to Richard Nixon. Now they call Pearl Harbor the day of infamy. 1971, when Nixon declared the war on drugs. That declaration and what happened afterwards has killed more people and destroyed more lives than Pearl Harbor. Because that's what Nixon did. And everybody in Nixon's administration knew they were lying about drugs. They even said it. John Eirichman, who was one of Nixon's aides, came out later on and admitted to it and said, of course we knew we were lying. The biggest threat to the Nixon administration, to the White House, to his election, was the anti-war left and black people but they couldn't make either one illegal. However, what they could do is associate marijuana with the hippies, cocaine and heroin with black people, criminalize them both heavily, vilify them every night on the news, arrest their leaders, break them up. That was the birth of our war on drugs. And what we saw right after that was our US prison population explode. We are 4.25% of the world's population, yet we imprison 25% of everybody imprisoned around the world. This is our solution to a mental health disorder. So lock them up. Then Reagan comes along. <laughs> and we try Just Say No again and the D.A.R.E. program. A hundred years ago, we tried this with the temperance movement. Same thing happened. Increased drug use. D.A.R.E. actually, those programs we gave to our kids that I was a product of, actually raised drug use. And then they passed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, which created that 101 disparity between powder cocaine and crack cocaine. Why? Because powder cocaine was your white man's drug. Wall Street. Crack cocaine was a southern black man's drug. We created Jim Crow in the 80s because the result of all these policies was increased use in substances, more dangerous use, and minorities lost their right to work and vote because of felonies. Dismal failure. But not too many people cared back then. People didn't care until the opiates came along. Because once opiates came along, and I speak bluntly here, white kids from the suburbs started dying. And that's when people started paying attention. But they weren't paying attention correctly because they didn't pay attention to our history. Because they repeated the same mistakes 
we have repeated over and over and over again. Because in the 90s, we had a pharmaceutical company named Purdue Pharma create OxyContin. Now, I can sit here and villainize Big Pharma because they do a lot of bad things. But I, what I won't do tonight is villainize pain medication because many people need them. And because of our overreach in policies and how we like to do prohibition and restrict access, what's happening right now with the chronic pain population is horrible. We're decimating a whole other population that needs medication. But Purdue, bad guys. They flooded our market with painkillers. And then we came in in 2008, and we did what we normally do. You can't have those. We're going to arrest everybody. But this is different. This was a whole new breed of opioid users. And we didn't do one thing. We never do anything. We never ask about the drug user, whether they be a recreational drug user, whether they be habitual, suffering from substance use disorder. We don't care. We went in and we started shutting down pill mills, pharmacies, doctors, with no care whatsoever what would happen afterwards. And what happened is we sent all of these prescription painkiller users to the black market. It's the equivalent of me locking these doors. We withhold food and water in here for three days. While we're in here for three days with no food or water, the FDA makes food and water a Schedule One substance. What happens when they open those doors in three days? Every single one of us becomes a criminal. And that is what we did to all of these kids, all these chronic pain patients, all of these recreational drug users, because half the people out there right now dying from opioid overdoses would much rather be taking painkillers, but they cannot access them. But that restricted access sent them to one of the deadliest drugs we know today, which is fentanyl. And now 100,000 people a year are dying. 100,000. That's the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing in this country every single day. And yet we do nothing. We still do what we've done since the 1840s. We want to criminalize people, restrict access, and lock them up. And we're doing that. Our prison population is still going through the roof. Our opiate prescriptions are down. Imports of heroin is down. But guess what keeps going up? Our overdose death rates. And they will continue to rise. Because we as a country, because of this house we live in, this ultimately flawed house, refuse to adapt common sense policies. Some policies known as harm reduction. In harm reduction, we will treat that cholesterol whether or not that person ever wants to worry about their diabetes. We will help an individual just because they need help, because they're a human being and they deserve it. No access to treatment, no barriers, no jumping through hoops to get life-saving medication. We know this works. This has worked in 20 other countries that have had overdose crisis, that have reversed it, but we can't seem to reverse ours because of this house. And this is not the first time we have tried to implement common sense safety, and this country has refused or been resistant. In 1968, the Federal Trade Commission told automakers, you need to put seatbelts in your cars. People protested against it, testified in DC. This is going to make people drive more dangerous. This illusion of safety caused more accidents. Guess what? Accidents, did go down. accidents went down. This didn't cause any more harm. 1988, we want to give condoms to homosexual men. People lost their mind. You're encouraging this behavior? This will not help the HIV epidemic. This is going to make it worse. Guess what? Harm reduction via condoms and medication is what helps stop the spread of HIV. Late 90s, let's change sex ed with teens. Let's stop this abstinence-only talk. Let's start giving them condoms and having real conversations. People lost their minds again. You're encouraging teen sex. STDs are going to go through the roof. Teen pregnancy is going to go up. Guess what happened? In the states that implemented these common sense programs, teen pregnancy went down and teen STDs went down. 2019, 100,000 people are dying a year from opioids. Let's give them Narcan so they can reverse an overdose. Let's have clean needle programs so they don't transmit hepatitis C or HIV and can engage with a social worker on a daily basis. 
let's have a safe consumption site, or we know them as safe injection sites, where people can go use and not die, and people are losing their minds. You're encouraging drug use. You're enabling them. That word doesn't mean anything. And we refuse to adopt these policies. And we have 30 years of history around the world that doing those three things together could reduce our overdose deaths by about 50%. And we do nothing. Because we're all stuck in this house we built. And I know there's a challenge here. And I know there's a takeaway. You know, as our kids keep dying, there's more we have to do. You know? We have to do what we can to rebuild this house as a country, as a state, as a community. And we can all play a part. We, all, we can't stay silent anymore and let the mistakes of our past continue to kill our children. We all have to get involved. Community grassroots organizations are all over the, all over the country, all over Missouri, fighting this fight, working to provide more access to opioid users to have Narcan, working on access to treatment, working to make needle exchange programs legal working to make safe injection sites a reality in the United States, all over, and we need people to get involved. And we also need to shake this apathetic nature that has consumed this country. The cowards, as I call them, on social media, that wish death upon a complete stranger because they chose to put a substance in their body. Our kids deserve better. So the biggest takeaway is we must do better with our next generations. We must teach empathy. We must teach people to care whether or not somebody made a bad decision or not, whether substance use is, is a disease or not. It doesn't make a difference. These are human beings that are dying, and we have a responsibility as their fellow humans to do what we can to help them and to prevent the next kid from dying. Thank you.